Hi, hi. So uh, i dag, der skal vi... Wrong language. Uh, hello. So today we're going to be talking about uh, pupil size and intelligence. Uh, this is uh, based on a study that I published recently. Uh, this study, uh, we're going to move me um, uh, up here, I guess. Whoops. Uh, yeah, smaller middle is fine. All right. So it's based on this study uh, that I published recently with uh, Helmut Nyborg, or Helmut Nyborg, as uh, the uh, Anglos say. And it was, of course, in the Mankind Quarterly. Where else would you publish good stuff? Um, so in uh, the context for this study is that uh, we go back to 2016. There was a big a media splash um, about a bunch of like PubSci magazines, this sort of thing, that write about this study that they looked at various uh, measures of intelligence and uh, pupil size. And um, there is uh, both a an effect of like um, of task complexity. If you have people do a complex task, supposedly this dilutes the pupils or, or something like that. But there is also, according to them, uh, just a straight out association, a straight up association such that uh, smarter people do have larger pupils, even in baseline. Uh, so that's what we see here in some of their plots. Um, this Their study actually had a, f a few samples and all of them seem to indicate the same thing and the p-values are not suspicious, at least insofar as social science are concerned. For instance, uh, this uh, this three samples here, all of them show about the same uh, association, and this middle one is 200-something people. That's That should be okay for finding a correlation of this size, right? Uh, of course, you can see here it's suspicious that the largest sample is uh, is the smallest correlation, but, you know, with N3 here, that's not really very uh, saying. However, of course, uh, we are very of... Um, problems and everything needs to be replicated. Um, one thing to note here uh, before I talk about the replication is that uh, here we have a race split, right? So that's going to be important later on. So um, an eye-catching finding for sure, ha 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 ha. All right, so, but uh, to put it in perspective, there are many reports of associations between physical and psychological measures of humans and, and also in other animals. Um, some of the familiar ones will be association of height uh, or intelligence with height uh, with lower obesity or lower BMI, uh, larger brain and head size and other uh, like brain metrics and uh, nearsightedness. Uh, nearsightedness being kind of famous for being one of the only clearly negative things that's as positively associated with intelligence, kind of sort of violating um, uh, whatever, you know, all positive things go together. Uh, who said that? It was someone in 1920, I forgot who this. Uh, it wasn't Terman, it was um, uh, one of the other early guys. Anyway, but um, political conservatism or kind of economic uh, liberalism or freedom preference, lower tax. Uh, there are some studies that show that this uh, relates to um, physical strength. Um, there are some, this literature isn't perfectly replicable as far as I can tell. Uh, but there's some re work to be done there and maybe, maybe it will turn out correct. Uh, political conservatism with physical health and mental health. Uh, we saw that in the prior video that there is a pretty strong uh, convincing evidence for uh, for these two health associations with conservatism. And, and in point of fact, uh, after I published the uh, mental illness and the and the left uh, the, that was covered in the previous previous video, there is a new mainstream journal study that used uh, large UK and a pan European like a pan EU. The European, I think, uh, value survey, and it also replicated the same relationship with depression and, and left-wing politics. And depression, of course, is, is one indicator of mental health, and so it seems to be basically replicated everywhere we look. Uh, there is even a Japanese study, apparently. So, pretty cool, but we'll look into more than the future. Um, dominance, confidence, kind of, um, it's related to height. Uh, you can imagine probably mostly in men, but maybe also in women. Um, Neuroticism uh, seems to be generally uh, related to worse physical health, even when objectively measured. So maybe you can say neurotic people are not maybe not entirely neurotic for no reason. They're also neurotic because their life is, is kind of overall worse for purely physical reasons that aren't just due to imaginary plights. Um, it also seems to relate to uh, BMI obesity. Um, there are probably more of these big five um, associations with physical traits. Uh, but if you look at the literature, it's kind of difficult to find because most studies are about perceived um, personality from 
pictures and this sort of thing. So they're not actually objectively measured, objective measures of people's physical traits and then correlated with personality. They're correlated of physical traits with perceived personality. So that's uh, a little bit problematic. Um, one funny one I found was uh, maternal instinct in women is negative related to height. And so um, uh, taller women are basically more masculine. They're are more confident. They're more into having a good career, this sort of thing. They have lower uh, fertility, less interested in kids and so on. So uh, this means that the men generally have a preference for uh, shorter women and this association actually being seen psychologically in women seems to suggest that men's preference for shorter women is, is totally rational from an ecological perspective, right? Individuals may vary, but uh, overall it's a good stereotype. Um, there are many more of these. I didn't spend more than like a few hours uh, looking into some of these. Um, unfortunately, many of these are not well replicated, uh, except for the like political conservatism, um, politics or health thing, and the intelligence. Uh, some of these, uh, but like some of these uh, big five associations, they definitely need more work, and they also need work in things like other reports uh, or peer report personality, because uh, self-rated personality has tons of biases and. Maybe the physical trait is just related to the, the bias of the self rating. So uh, definitely much more work to be done there. Um, so we need to get to work and replicate them in large data sets. So that's what we did. The Vietnam Experience Study, I think I've maybe talked about it before, but the Vietnam Experience Study, also known as VES, VES is a, um, a study of a, from a base of the US Army. And in the 90, late 1980s, uh, no, 1960s, they um, they inducted a bunch of people into the army and uh, some of these people went to Vietnam and some of them didn't. Some of them went to like Germany or Korea or this sort of thing. And so you get like this match control uh, design and uh, they followed them up for health measures and like fertility and income and education, all that stuff in approximately 18 years later or, or 17 or so. Uh, 4,400 something people and it's been used in more than hundred intelligence studies and uh, probably maybe a thousand various studies. Um, about half of them, a bit more than half, are Vietnam veterans, and the other ones are, are some of these other, you know, controls. Um, the cognitive measures are superb. Uh, there's about 19 uh, diverse cognitive tests, depending on how you classify them. Some of them you can you could maybe group, like they're all memory tests, or you can split them up and say this one is immediate recall and delayed recall, and so on. So it depends a bit on how you how you want to split things, right? It's a lumber splitter uh, issue. Some of these also have item data. There's about 200 uh, items that have data for everybody. Uh, so this is actually uh, maybe the best data set of item data from a Western country, uh, at least as far as I know. Um, there's hundreds of medical measures, blood work, medical history, fertility, even some children's uh, measures like head size of the children, uh, race of the mother, education of the mother, but only, uh, only partial data there. Uh, sperm counts, some of this have been used before. Um, it's actually, the data is actually in the public domain, but because the army never released kind of a public use version of it, everybody seems to be using some old converted data file from like tapes, like those uh, really uh, those fixed width format tapes from the 80s. And um, so I have one of these copies that, uh, that Helmut had uh, gotten once time he was in the US uh, decades ago and had, it's all converted now to normal format. So it can totally be used by you. Um, however, all the documents, uh, documentation, and the codebook for this are not entirely uh, up to standards. And what we went, we're working on is that we are trying to remedy this, making everything standardized and searchable. And um, of course, you should support this effort because it costs some money. Uh, some of this paperwork uh, it just takes too long for me, so I'm outsourcing it. And uh, we need some money to pay for this uh, outsourcing. It should be, it should cost about a few thousand dollars. So. Uh, one or two, maybe three thousand dollars to get this, and then it will be public, and everybody will be happy. Um, so that's the study. Oh, by the way, the reason that the uh, the army uh, was interested in the Vietnam stuff is that a lot of the veterans were complaining that uh, their exposure to Agent Orange, you know, chemical tax during the Vietnam War, uh, caused them all kinds of uh, physical ailments and psychological trouble, and so on. And so the the army uh, sponsored this massive study to look into this, and they basically found that. It was mostly in their head, right? Most of the physical, there were not really many strong associations with Agent Orange exposure and actual physical uh, indicators, cancer, death, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's none of that stuff. 
Uh, Vietnam War was, however, uh, associated with PTSD and some of this other stuff. But that can be caused by the media saying people uh, need to uh, be very sad because they got exposed to that stuff. So you have to be a little careful about interpretation. Um, okay, so that's the background. Pupil size measurement. How exactly you can maybe imagine someone taking a close-up photo of the eye, and, and that's exactly right. So in this study, they used the machine called the Optic 2000. It's pretty old equipment. Uh, there's like a new ones like Optic 5000 and so on. And uh, I found a picture of this machine that was for sale on, I think, eBay. And uh, it's quite simple. You, you put this in a room with no windows and people simply lean into the machine like this. And once you're, uh, once you're, this button is pressable. So you press that button with your forehead here. And so when, when you lean into the machine, these uh, shutters open and inside there are these various slides and uh, in these you're, you can test color blindness and stuff like that and also this machine will take uh, photos of your eyes in standardized conditions um, since your eyes can only see in here uh, light from in the room and so on it cannot um, it cannot affect your pupil size so it's very standardized equipment uh, and shows a high reliability as we'll see um, it shows like you know the slides for color blindness and uh, depth, depth uh, not depth perception but like a visual acuity and so on. Uh, one way of looking at uh, measurement um, liability is we look at people who are, were measured uh, and everybody uh, were measured twice because they measured each eye independently, and so they measured the eye size in or the pupil size I should say in um, in whole millimeters, so a tenth of a centimeter, right? And um, I don't know why they didn't go any further down, but uh, that's, I, I guess, a, a problem with this equipment. It didn't have more accuracy. As we can see, however, it's not really a problem because if we correlate these across eyes, they correlate uh, 9 and 7. And in fact, the army uh, conducted a, um, a study of whether the operator, you know, the technician running the machine, whether uh, they affected the measurement. And so they did a kind of ANOVA analysis to see whether the uh, the technician uh, affected the measurements and they found no no such effects and they did this for hundreds of variables and there's basically no effects anywhere. So these measurements are highly reliable based on the cross eye findings and there doesn't seem to be any kind of radar effects that are worth caring about. Um, it's a little tricky to plot because of the whole millimeter thing. Uh, so I plotted them so that, uh, you know, larger, that means there's a lot of dots here, right? And yes, I should have made these uh, the breakpoints uh, kind of aligned with these, but uh, apparently we forgot. So anyway, so to do the main replication, it's very simple. We take the 19 test, we factorize that, we get a G factor. We score that for everybody, it's standardized. We take the pupil size, uh, we just take the average of the two eyes. As you can see, they're on the same scale, millimeters, and they're super highly correlated. So taking the average is very simple. Um, you get a correlation of 0 0.05, which is uh, you know, highly significant at this sample size because um, 4,400 or something people. However, 0 0.05 is, is very far from the initial claims of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.4 even uh, region of findings. So it seems to be mostly null and um, despite the uh, plausible looking nature of the original study. However, it gets worse. Um, once we look inside groups, uh, so these are the scatter plots. Uh, let me go for a so these are the scatter plots by, um, by by race group in this data set. And um, the sample sizes are like 4,000 or so white people, I believe about 500 blacks, 200 Hispanics, and these groups are tiny, uh, like 20 people or something. And so we don't really care about these, um, but these are all flat. And if you do run the, um, the correlation p-values inside all these groups, they're all they're all insignificant, right? Or not uh, insignificant, as you say. So uh, there is a, a pattern when we merge everybody, but nothing within group. And so that's basically a race confound, right? Um, however, it could be that there's some covariate that suppresses this uh, this finding, right? Maybe uh, age or something is related and it's kind of, for whatever reason, somehow hides the finding, uh, hides the decline, no, hides the finding. And um, so I ran a bunch of regression models. Um, this is the, the overall, overall model and um, I guess the standardization is a bit off since it's 04 here, but 05 here. Uh, well, it's close enough. Uh, anyway, we see that uh, basically there's no experimental power. It explains 0.2% of the variance, uh, which is essentially nothing. If we add a bunch of controls, age, um, 
race, uh, drugs, recent use, smoker status, drinks, uh, which hour they measured pupil um, uh, size and so on. We don't really find anything. The association stays at zero. And that's also true if we just look within white people or white people with uh, covariates or Hispanics. Hispanics with covariates, this one is not significant. You can see the standard error is, is um, there's no stars anywhere here. And we would probably uh, need at least, you know, one star consistently somewhere here to be kind of convinced there's, there's anything here. However, if we look at the table down here, we, stu we do see that if you calculate the mean by uh, race, uh, there's an interesting pattern such that uh, such that uh, whites have larger pupil uh, sizes than, than Hispanics and black people. And uh, so this relates to the same kind of the, the G, the intelligence gap in the same groups, but without there being an association within group. So this is kind of similar to the, the life history speed pattern where between countries you have these large effects uh, that's associated with intelligence, but within countries that uh, these life history, at least as measured by these uh, kind of questionnaire scales that uh, Woodley and Figueredo and these people, they like, uh, there doesn't seem to be much pattern, maybe a very weak one. Uh, so that's, uh, so why do we get the same hierarchy with no association within group? It's, uh, it's definitely a little puzzle. Uh, we're going to be looking more into this. So when we saw these, uh, Helmut and I, we of course uh, checked Google Scholar. Are there other studies reporting pupil size by race or something similar, eye, uh, eye size? And in fact, there are. There are a bunch of studies and even with East Asians and the East Asians do show uh, larger pupil sizes. So we have the same four way uh, racial hierarchy as, as you expect from, uh, the, uh, from many other traits, right? Uh, so it's definitely uh, curious. Um, we're going to be replicating this one uh, in enhanced data. So these are massive uh, American medical data sets and they're all public and they do have uh, pupil size. So that's going to be maybe for um, maybe not next issue, but maybe the uh, winter issue of mankind. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Of course, all the uh, claims I made here, or well, most of them, you can find the uh, sources for here. And so this essentially concludes the video. Um, I want to, of course, iterate that if you want more people to do studies with this kind of uh, data set, uh, you need to actually cough up with some, some money so we can get this uh, show on the road. And with that said, I uh, bid you farewell and uh, you can, may now return to your cultural revolution. Ciao.